Sports. I'm joined once again this week by Alex Barth of 98.5 The Sports Hub. You can follow him on Twitter at Real Alex Barth, and the Real Alex Barth is recuperating a little bit. I'm glad to have you back on, Alex. Yeah, I think uh, the last show I did before uh, I got sick and my voice gave, gave out was actually with you last week, so uh, I apologize if I was short on that one, but uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. We'll see. It's a little uh, little stamina test, little build up here. All right, we are going to have to get into news that is unfortunate for Major League Baseball, but I, I think everybody saw this coming the way it played out. You know, in late December, early January, we knew this was coming, and I want to um, read from the report of Evan Drellich of the Athletic, who just does a, a tremendous job covering. Uh, Major League Baseball overall. Obviously, he has his Boston roots. But uh, Dateline, Jupiter, Florida, dueling threats loom over baseball's negotiations at a key juncture in the final week of February. Major League Baseball doubled down on Wednesday on its stale, uh, stated intention to cancel games if a new deal is not reached by the end of the month. That would be Monday February 28th. Meanwhile, over the last few weeks, the players have told the league at several points that if games are indeed canceled, they will not grant owners an expanded postseason, an element worth at least $100 million annually, industry sources estimate. The first time MLB positioned February 28th as a deadline was about two weeks ago. On Wednesday, the third straight day of talks between players and owners at Roger Dean Stadium. Major League Baseball wanted to make sure its threats were taken seriously in response to reporting that players were not necessarily looking at that deadline as firm. The commissioner's office, Rob Manfred and company, underscored its position, telling players at the bargaining table, no less, and subsequently reporters, that the deadline is indeed hard. Um, we're getting down to brass tacks now, and I think uh, what it's coming down to is just how much uh, the players are, are going to get out of owners uh, in terms of arbitration and uh, player uh, negotiation in terms of what free agency is. It's always been about that, but paying more to younger players. Yeah, I, just to go back to the deadline real quick, maybe I'm naive in this. I still don't believe that's a hard deadline. Like, Again, maybe I'm just being childish. All right, so if they don't agree by Monday, then the season's shortened. So, but they're going to keep talking. Okay, so if they agree on Tuesday, is it 161 game season? Like, what of does that not. mean, right? Yeah, right. So, I mean, we, we can you use know, some logic from years past right. um, when team where uh, Major League Baseball was was able to alter the schedule a little bit and get all 162 games in for instance the 1990 season um you know the reds won the world series that year i remember it for that reason but it also congratulations yeah the season started a little bit later but that year they were able to adjust the schedule uh throughout the course of the year and get all 100 162 games in i think that's kind of what we're looking at right now the skit the owners want to make it clear to players that if the deadline isn't in place or the deal isn't in place by February 28th, they're going to have to start canceling games. That doesn't mean those games can't be made up, but uh, certainly those games will be canceled. Well, it seems to me like they're doing it to threaten game checks, right? And if those games yes, are made up, that's then, exactly then the game right. checks come back. So yeah, that's, that's, you know, how I view that deadline is it's essentially another bargaining chip for the owners. And sometimes we see these things where there's a deadline set and it's not met. And then the sides kind of go apart for mm -hmm. a couple of days and do their own thing. That doesn't seem like what's happening here. So I like when we spoke last week, right. I remember you said something along the lines of you think that they're closer than maybe they're putting out publicly and realistically right. a deal could get done in a day or two. I didn't believe that as much at the time that you said it last week, I think that's more true now. I didn't believe that a week ago, that they could snap their fingers and get a deal done. This kind of arbitrary deadline, and they're they're calling it, you know, set in stone. I'm calling it arbitrary. The fact that they're hyping up this deadline so much kind of makes me believe that they, that they think they're closer, uh, that they've made significant progress in this last week where 
there were reports that they were going to start meeting more regularly, and that's been the case. And Sean Henry's getting involved, and Steinbrenner's getting involved, et cetera. So I, I think they have made significant progress here in the last week. It's just a matter of, like you said, some of those salary things, which is what it's going to come down to, especially for younger players, right. pushing it over the finish line. So there's a difference here and a, a, a uh, certainly an understanding of the nuance of what progress is. And I think the fact that a week ago, even two weeks ago, proposals were not being exchanged. They're being exchanged now. Progress is a different story altogether. They may not be making a lot of progress in some of the key issues, but I think once they keep meeting and talking over the issues, I think progress is inevitable as long as they're in the room together. You know, that's why I think a lot of fans roll their eyes when they see at the bottom of the crawl of Fox Sports or ESPN that, you know, players and owners met for 15 minutes and left the room. I mean, that's, you know, what, what is the point of that other than to say, you know, I hate you and you hate me and fine, you know, and our deals are very far apart. But um, I think the fact that they're meeting for longer and longer periods of time, I take that as a positive. Um, also quoting from Evan's uh, story, Evan Drellich of The Athletic, as far as proposals went on Wednesday, there was little progress. MLB made a revised offer in one area the minimum salary. It raised the starting salary by $10,000 from its prior offer to $640,000 from $630,000. The minimum would go up by an additional $10,000 over the five years of the CBA. The players are asking for a minimum that starts at $775,000 and climbs by $30,000 each year. That, To me, those numbers on the face, uh, Alex, and feel free to chime in here, I don't think that's a yeah. lot. I think that can be closed pretty quickly. No? Yeah, I think so. And it's there was an interesting stat out yesterday with the minimum salaries of the four major leagues and baseballs heading into this lockout. And it will likely be changed. How much, we don't know. But baseball is significantly lower than the other three sports. Now, baseball season is significantly longer. It's twice as long as, as basketball and hockey and obviously exponentially mm -hmm. longer than football. So... That's one where I think it, it's going to be really tough for the league to kind of shake that off because there's da there's data that backs it up. Um, it's like you said, kind of a, in, in some way, minimal increase. It's not because of how many players it would impact, but that, that shouldn't be a sticking point. That should be something that the owners can give to the players that the players can take as a big win. You know, that's the thing. Like, ultimately, we, and I, I don't know. I don't want to break down how labor negotiations work because I know very little about that, if anything. But basically, each side is looking for things they can give up and still be OK, but at the same time, looking for things that they can go back to their base with and say, hey, we got this. This was a big win for us. We could be proud of this. To me, the minimum salary debate is, is one that kind of checks the box. You know, it's something the players can go back with, be very proud of going back to their camp. Well, at the same time, I don't think it's anything the, the owners are going to hang their heads about losing. So in terms of things that are left that could maybe hold this thing up, this should not be the last issue. Like if this is the last issue to be crossed off the list, I think you have to feel pretty good about this thing being over sooner rather than later. So it's interesting you say that because MLB felt that the players attempt to raise the proposed minimums was a step backward, but previously in negotiations, baseball has lowered its own minimum salary proposal, moving in the opposite directions. The players want after making other adjustments to uh, its different proposals. The most progress this week is probably, according to Drellich, been in the amateur draft system. Both sides have proposed a draft lottery as a means of dissent. Uh, disincentivizing teams from tanking and that's a big deal for a lot of players and why is that a big deal for a lot of players Alex because the fewer teams that go into the tank the more likely teams are to spend on expanding their payroll for a competitive roster that that's as simple as I can make that and I think that you know both sides agree on that MLB on Monday increased the number of picks it would uh, it would have uh, be selected by that lottery from three to four. The union responded uh, this past Tuesday, a couple of days ago, by lowering the number of picks it would include from eight to seven. The players feel that the more picks chosen by lottery, 
the less rewarding the tanking would be for teams with an appetite to do so. Obviously, anytime you talk about tanking, you talk about the Pittsburgh Pirates. Right. They have built up a great farm system. And if the season does get underway, Alex, they are a team that could start making some noise uh, if they sign a free agent or two. Uh, keep an eye on the Pirates. But they're, they've certainly built up their yeah. farm system. The Seattle Mariners have built up their farm system. Uh, and the Red Sox are going to be the Red Sox. I mean, they're not, they're going to certainly under Heim Bloom want to build their farm system. And, and with guys like Tristan Cassis uh, in the waiting and Marcelo Mayer, um, you've got guys that are going to come up through the ranks and we'll get to the Red Sox in a little bit, but you've got uh, players who are going to make an impact with the Red Sox coming up through the pipeline. Well, I would even say, look at the Astros, right? They're kind of on the back end of it, but they're they're the crown of that whole tanking thing. I, I actually disagree with the players that more spots in the lottery discourages tanking because if you can be the eighth worst team in the league, you know, you don't necessarily have to be – the more teams that have a shot at the first overall pick, I think the more teams are going to tank. I hate lotteries in general. Yes. I actually don't think I, – I don't think they prevent tanking. I really – not to the extent – that maybe some leagues would claim they do. I think they're stupid. I think they're unnecessary. If this is what it takes for us to get baseball, I guess fine. There's a lot more you could do to fix both the draft and the sport as a whole. Let teams trade picks for starters. That seems like a no brainer. That's an archaic rule or lack of a rule that baseball is dealing with right now. If it's what it takes to get across the, 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 the finish, finish line, line, fine. I just don't think ultimately that, aspect of the goat negotiations is going to have the impact that the players think it will. And I want to talk about uh, the 10 players in the Red Sox minor league camp who could actually reach the big leagues this season. Chad Jennings, again, for the athletic wrote about this on Thursday, a uh, terrific story. And, you know, in addition to some of the upper level guys in house, the Red Sox have signed 10 minor league free agents who could reasonably open in AAA. The reason this is a bigger story than normal Alex um, is because there's going to be a lot of attention on minor league camp, which is getting underway uh, in all of these uh, destinations, both in Grapefruit League in Florida and the uh, Cactus League in Arizona. The Red Sox uh, scheduled to officially open camp with pictures and captures minor league, that is, on March 6th. Full, squ uh, full squads will uh, start five days later. Again, these are for minor league pictures and captures and minor league position players. Some of the relievers to keep an eye on, Taylor Cole, Michael Feliz, Zach Kelly, and Tyler Danish. Infielders, Roberto Ramos, Yolmer Sanchez, Roldani, Baldwin, and outfielders, Rob Ref Snyder, certainly somebody um, uh, Red Sox fans know from the uh, uh, trade with the Minnesota Twins, Christian Stewart, and Johan Mises. So do you have your eyes on anybody uh, in minor league camp, or are you more or less interested in some of the guys, Alex, that started uh, or, or figured to start in AAA and uh, have a fast track to the majors, i.e. I. Tristan Cassis? Yeah, I, you know, I, we talked about Cassis last time I was on. I I, I'm very high on him. I think he's the starting first baseman by July 1st, if that, you know, if not sooner. So I go into that whole spiel again, you know, I'm not really sold on Bobby Dobbick as the first baseman. I know maybe it could, could, um, and there goes, there's the COVID fog could cast this play third and, and endeavors becomes the DH maybe long-term. I don't know about this year. So yeah, I, I gave that whole spiel already. I'm actually more interested in some of the relievers, and maybe mm -hmm. this is just because I was in, I was in Lowell when these guys were like I got to know them a little bit. But sure, uh, Durbin Feltman was a guy I remember when they drafted him at a TCU in 2018. That you know there was speculation that he could play in the majors that season. There was some thought that he could be one of these rare guys who immediately comes in and he was lights out as the closer for TCU that year. Had a great 18. They don't end up calling him up. Uh, and then he struggles in 19 and then obviously no season in 20. He was okay last year. There's just so much hype around him. I, I, I don't believe that he's been that much of a bust. I think maybe he had a tough adjustment, but I'd like to see him get his shot. And another guy that interests me a little further down the list, I think uh, Jennings had, I mean, he has him 10th is, is Thad Ward. 
he's an interesting long reliever guy. The Red Sox yes. traditionally have really liked those sort of pitchers, right? He was a starter in the, in the minors, probably still could be a starter, but he, he's more like a three to four inning relief guy, maybe an opener. If the Red Sox go back to that formula in their rotation, um, really nasty stuff. He's, I, I don't want to say is like a Chris sale type release, but it's really three. It's not quite sidearm, but it's really three quarters. There's a lot of snapping motion to it. The ball really pops out of his hand. Um, and he's a really fiery competitor, which is something you look for. And I think is undersold a lot in relievers. He's a guy that he can come in bases loaded, no outs. And he believes he's going to get out of that truly deeply. He does. So I think guys with that mentality, I'm always partial with those guys. I think they can be, you know, if they get in a rhythm can be a dangerous weapon. So I don't know that he ultimately makes it up this year. Jennings has him, quote, not really much of a call-up candidate, but also too notable to leave off a list like this. The pitching's just so thin. You can't rule it out. So th those would be my two guys, Feltman and, uh, and Ward. So I'm going to look at Yolmer Sanchez, second baseman. And uh, I look at him because second base to me is a position on the Red Sox that um, is certainly fluid. Would you agree? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think that they would look at a guy like Yolmer Sanchez. Um, he may have the and, and Jennings agrees and, and writes this. Cassis might have the greatest potential for massive big league impact this season, but it's Sanchez who might have the clearest path to actually make the Red Sox opening day roster for the reasons that I just mentioned. He was the American League's gold glove winner at second base for the White Sox in 2019. He had an OPS plus of 87 since 2017. That's nearly identical to Jose Iglesias's 89 OPS plus over the same time frame. Time frame. Uh, Sanchez spent last season in AAA, but he's a known uh, but he is a known quantity at a position where the Red Sox are not, not quite settled. One or two free agent signings could change this, but for now, Sanchez and Christian Arroyo might be at the top of the second base depth chart. I think the Red Sox would give him a shot. I, th I think they would too, and they haven't been afraid at that position, right? Guys like Christian Arroyo, guys like Jonathan Arauz to kind of take those 4A guys and see what they get, like, not 4A guys now, Arroyo's established himself, but take those potential 4A guys and see what they can do. I saw, you know, some roster projections have the Red Sox bringing back Jose Iglesias. Maybe he's their second baseman. I, I have too. I just, you know, if they're going to flirt with the luxury taxes where maybe that minimum salary thing comes in, right, you're going to pay – Iglesias is a significant amount more, even if you're paying him towards, you know, the lower end of a starter salary. So right. um, if, you know, if they're going to go out and make a big move, if it's Correa, if it's Rondon, and I don't know how realistic those are, if it's Suzuki um, and they're going to push that luxury tax, then yeah, a guy like giving a guy like Omar Sanchez a shot would be textbook. So yeah, I, I absolutely think he's somebody who factors in and is at a position where they've historically been comfortable taking that risk. Because they have so many bats throughout the lineup, Alex, I think uh, the Red Sox have been able to skate a little bit on uh, second base and since really Dustin Pedroia. And I think they've been able to do a good job plugging the holes. They did so in 2018. Um, they did so certainly uh, last year on their way to the ALCS before uh, losing out to the Astros. I just think that, you know, the, the Red Sox are a team that um, has the ability to, you know, mix and match because they are so offensively potent at other positions. Yeah. And they, they, they have a lot of versatility to guys like Kike Hernandez, Christian Arroyo, right? Can right. move around the diamond. So that, that helps them out as well in that. Yeah. So anything else on your mind in terms of baseball, you're just waiting for these clowns to get their CBA. Done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you followed and, and we're recording this on Thursday afternoon. I don't know if you followed the, uh, I don't know. What, what do you want to call it? Mini camp, um, whatever that some of the Red Sox held at Florida Gulf coast. This morning, it was Sale, Matt Barnes, Nick Pavetta was there. Um, those are three names that stand out. I think there were a couple other guys. So guys are still getting work in, at least the pitchers are, which I think is a bigger deal, right? Um, you know, hitters can, can go in a cage and all that, and, and they'll get their camp. So guys are staying ready. 
and Sale looked good. I know I kind of said on the last show that I'm not expecting much from him this year, but Sale looked good. Matt Barnes looked good. As you know. So I know you are. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully we get a couple more. And, you know, shout out to Matt Barnes, too, who put that on Instagram live. He didn't have to do that. So hopefully, as long as this thing, you know, it doesn't stay locked out for long. But if it does stay locked out, hopefully we get more of that content and these guys keep working out and we keep kind of seeing what they're up to because it is a little taste of baseball. So. It is, and I'm looking forward to it. I frankly, Alex, expect the baseball season to go on pretty ninety five percent normal. I maybe, and I actually, I think the players will also give in in terms of they are not they're not going to, um, you know, try and cut out you know a major portion of the postseason if they don't start on time and if play. One of the ver- nuances of the back and forth over whether or not the season starts on time is right. if the player, if the owners want to dock pay, the players are going to say, well, we're not going to play your entire postseason and cost you a hundred million dollars. Um, right. I, I think it'll, th- that will be resolved somehow in some way, the postseason will go on um, in its full, in its entirety. And I don't think the players will get be that petty. And uh, I think the, find a way to work it out i still am of the belief that this baseball season uh gets underway somewhere around boston marathon day patriots day and uh, that's when the season begins yeah i just even if it's and that would ultimately be a good outcome i guess but even if it's 150 games 155 games that's two shortened seasons in three years and obviously they they couldn't help the last one but remember they had a chance to play 80 games and it basically got shortened down to 50 due to bickering, right? 60. So 60, right. So just two shortened seasons in three years, it, it leaves a bad, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. It really does. So I, I'm hoping for 160. I think there's the ones like I made the joke before about well, if they agree on Tuesday, do they play 161? I think the 162 number is significant. I think baseball needs to show the fans that they can play 162 game season because as ridiculous as that sounds, they haven't been able to do that recently. Right. So I think it would mean a lot to the fans of the sport. And by the way, to advertisers who oh, are, you know, no question. important to the future of the game. I think it's important. Baseball shows that it can play 162 game season. So I'm still, I'm again, 150 would be great. I'm still putting stock in that 162 game number though. Well, he is Alex Barth. He does a wonderful job covering all things Boston sports for 98.5 The Sports Hub. You can follow him on Twitter at Real Alex Barth. I want to thank everyone for downloading today's podcast. Thank our great guest, Alex Barth. For Alex Barth, I'm Mike Petralia, and this has been the Red Sox Beat Podcast powered by CLNS Media.